Thank you very much, James. So I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction, really, just to touch up on some of the questions I get asked in clinic and also things that are interesting. Uh, we still do not have a very clear idea about how the disease uh, process works. So I think the first thing, which is still a big mystery, Patrick Chinry mentioned this, has been a struggle for nearly, what, 20 years in terms of understanding why some people lose vision and others do not. And then the big thing is we've discussed already this morning is whether or not hormonal factors have a role to play in the uh, disease evolution and whether this could potentially be used as a form of treatment. And the big topic labeled very loosely mitochondrial antioxidants is whether or not there is uh, any way of preventing further visual loss once it has started and then to improve the visual prognosis. And then what's coming around the corner, of course, there are ongoing gene therapy trials at the moment. Uh, we don't have the results yet, but this is obviously a major area of interest, not just for labors of neuropathy, but in the field of uh, eye genetics, generally speaking. Then finally, again, things that are people are asking me on a more regular basis now in clinic is with regards you know, preventing the transmission of the long mutation to their children. So the big question is really, why some carriers will lose vision and others do not. And, you know, a lot of the time we'll quote this in papers that if you're a man, your risk of losing vision is about 50%. If you're a woman, it's about 10%. But you have to take a very little pinch of salt because this is a bit of a guesstimate because there's a big variation both between families and also within families. And this is just two examples, really, going back to when I first did my research on non, uh, when I was a medical student. So this is a family here, multi-generation. There is only one affected man here. No one else has been affected, right? On the other hand, you have this other big family here, and almost all of them will end up losing vision, and also at a very young age here. This is a bit outdated. Now we do know that three out of the, uh, two out of the three sisters have also lost vision. So clearly, you know, Having the mitochondrial genetic defect is essential, but there must be other factors involved. So you've met Sarah today uh, at the meeting. She's actually funded by a very generous bequest from uh, the Ferguson family. And what she's going to be doing, and she's doing it now, hopefully, right, is to have a look again at all of her long pedigrees in this country to try and derive a better estimate of your risk of losing vision and also whether if a mother is affected, there's a, if there's a higher risk of the children uh, losing vision or not. So uh, hopefully next year, Sarah can give you the uh, results of this analysis. And the reason for mentioning this is it has relevance in terms of future treatment, because if we're better at stratifying the risk of someone losing vision, they might be the one that you, you want, we want to target in terms of uh, prophylactic measures, preventing the disease to st from starting in the first place. This is obviously nowhere close to where we are now, but this might become an issue when better treatment comes around the corner. So the two things these rough figures will tell us are firstly that there is incomplete penetrance, not everyone's going to lose vision, and also if you're a man you have a four to f uh, five times increased risk of losing vision compared with a, a female carrier. And all these additional risk factors have been very difficult uh, to dissect because it's a relatively rare disease. You know, there's not enough experience even in a major center seeing a lot of patients. And we mentioned this morning in the talk on the clinical features about how smoking is a major risk factor. And this is clearly something that all carriers should not be doing. So the, the other thing which has been a major area of contention for the past two decades really is whether there is anything on your nuclear genome, which is influencing your risk of losing vision. And going back to some quite early papers, the best model that people came up with when they did the statistics was that it was a combination of two things, that you had something on the X chromosome, because obviously this is a major difference between the sexes. A woman will have two X chromosomes, a man will have an X and a Y. And whether there's a factor on the X chromosome interacting with this mutation in your mitochondrial genome, and the two of them working together causing visual loss. Sounds very straightforward, it's very elegant, you know, but all the studies done so far, including studies done in Newcastle, studies done elsewhere in the US, have not really been able to pin down a specific factor on the X chromosome. 
Why is that the case? Well, could it be that we have not been able to include enough patients to have enough power to detect the real change? Or could it be much more complex, is that there is not just one factor on the X chromosome, but there are multiple genetic factors spread all over your genome, which is interacting to increase your risk of losing vision. So hopefully, you know, uh, there will be an answer coming around the corner, and we were somehow helped by the fact that technology has moved on. What used to be very difficult is now much easier, for example, sequencing your whole genome. So this is a study which has been brought forward by Patrick Chinry to his links here in Cambridge, which is, let's forget about the X chromosome in isolation. Let's look at the, your whole genome, which is what, roughly 3.2 billion base pair, and let's look very carefully at each one of them with a very high density uh, marker to try and identify the possible risk factors. And this was made possible really because of this very long-standing uh, relationship and friendship over the years with Patrick here. It, some of you might know Phil Griffiths in the middle who's really been my you know, spiritual mentor for many years. He's, an, he's a fellow of Tamarges. He moved on to Gibraltar to uh, work there for many years. And you know, as part of this clinic that I was doing with Phil Griffiths and also a joint clinic I was doing with Patrick Chinwe, we've been able to collect a lot of samples from patients with long, both affected and unaffected carriers. And the reason I mention this is that, you know, the chances are if you come to my clinic, I will gently ask you at the end, would you be happy for me to take a blood sample from you? So it's being used actually for uh, serious research and I'm very grateful for you being patient at the end of a very, of very long clinic. So. Research is expensive, you know, we can't do everything, but certainly in the UK we've been very fortunate to have resources on various uh, angles. And uh, Patrick Cherney managed to get us involved with this NIHR bioresource project. And as part of this project, we've been able to uh, do whole genome sequencing for 35 pairs of uh, family members, one affected, one unaffected, and the data is currently being analyzed. And the other player in the picture is someone called Gavin Hudson, uh, who is still in Newcastle well, probably will be in your council, and uh, he's also been very helpful in terms of helping us analyze the data. So I don't have the answer, perhaps Patrick will be able to feed back a little bit more, but clearly this is a major question in terms of identifying the risk factors that trigger your risk of losing vision. So the second thing which someone mentioned actually this morning is this issue of hormonal <coughs> factors in the uh, in the evolution of the disease, because this is clearly something which is very different between men and women. You know, women have very high levels of estrogens and uh, progesterone. Uh, and at least based on in vitro data in cell models done by the group of Valeria Carelli, you know, they did find that if they treated some cells in a petri dish with estrogen derivatives, these cells had a much uh, lower risk of undergoing <coughs> cell death. So it's interesting, you know, it could explain part of the uh, sex bias. And obviously then they went on to the next level in terms of understanding whether or not this could be used as a therapeutic intervention. The difficulty is that if you give someone estrogens and he's a man, he's obviously going to develop a lot of unwanted side effects, including feminization, and you don't want that. Uh, and the only way you would be able to do this is by providing a molecule with estrogen-like uh, effects, but without the detrimental uh, consequences. So it's still very early days. I'm mentioning this because people will be asking you about whether or not, for example, if they are reaching the perimenopausal period, whether they, sh they should go on HRT. We discussed that this morning. Personally, I don't think there is absolutely any evidence of people going on HRT simply on the basis that this might prevent them from losing vision. Uh, Patrick might have his own views that we can discuss uh, in the uh, panel questions. But this is out there. and. Uh, people are working on whether or not they could be using these estrogen-like molecules as a way of preventing someone from losing vision. So the other big topic, you know, which is uh, quite challenging, is how we can try and rescue the optic nerve in labor's optic neuropathy. There are advantages that we have as, as ophthalmologists. We can observe the optic nerve very clearly at the back of the eye. There are ways of measuring the thickness of the optic nerve, whether there is any leakage, etc. But the Big difficulty is also the fact that we have very limited access to tissue samples for studies. Uh, people are trying to get around this by <coughs> trying to produce these retinal ganglion cells, these special cells within the optic nerve, uh, using stem cells, but still very early days again. And uh, you might have seen in the press that 
there was a clinic somewhere in the US where people ended up having very serious complications from having stem cells injected into their eyes. So I think a degree of caution is needed every time you see someone advertising some fancy treatment on the internet saying that they could restore your vision using some form of stem cell. So the one which is a bit more uh, you know, in the now is this whole area of mitochondrial antioxidants. I've, I've, I've kind of used this term you know, because it's a bit simplistic, but you know, it, it's the one that a lot of people will be using out there you know, in, the, um, uh, in social media. So I think the first thing to put in context, the fact that the evidence base for most of these treatments is very thin on the ground. And based on a systematic review done by Patrick here with Gerald Pfeffer, who was his fellow uh, until he went back to Canada, and also some reviews that we published more recently, it's very clear that a lot of these studies published out there have a very small number of patients, right? And the fact that they have a very small number of patients mean that we can't really draw any serious conclusion. It might give us uh, information on safety. It might give us a little bit of indication whether the treatment might be working in the right direction, but to be able to test that, in a, in a very robust fashion, as we heard this morning from uh, Nick Siro from the uh, AR UK Society, you really need to do a proper randomized controlled trial. And a lot of people will be taking these various combinations of uh, so-called antioxidants. Coenzyme Q10 is, you know, I'm, I'm very dubious about this because it does not even cross the blood-brain barrier, but some people do take it. And all these others here, vitamins, um, all these cocktails, you know, it's pretty safe, but it's not going to change very much in terms of the prognosis for labor's optic neuropathy. So this is really the a main, a main point that we're going to be discussing, I'm pretty sure, is the role of idebinone uh, being marketed as Raxone by Santera. As Patrick mentioned uh, earlier, we were involved in, with the major trial that led to uh, the uh, drug eventually being accepted by the EMA uh, for the treatment of this condition. But just to backtrack a little bit, the reason why Debnon is thought to be helpful is because it does improve the amount of energy being produced by your mitochondria, at least you know, based on some in vitro data published in the literature. And at the time I was doing my PhD, I got involved with this randomized control trial, which was for a reasonably short period of time, around six months. There were a few centers involved, Newcastle, Munich with Thomas Klopstrop, and then more uh, a bit later, uh, a group from Montreal came on board. And obviously now with the benefit of hindsight, there's a lot of things that could have been made better, both in terms of the patient groups that got selected in the first place and also the duration of treatment, but you can't undo the past. All the patients had a confirmed mutation and they all had visual loss within the past five years, which is probably a major problem here because we do know that the longer you wait, the less likely you're going to get a beneficial effect from it. But anyhow, right, what it did show is that we could recruit a sufficient number of patients. 85 patients were recruited eventually and randomized. And just to give a brief overview, there were two groups. One group got the active medication idebinone. The other group got a dummy tablet, the placebo. And then the end point was at week 24. And the dose that was used was 300 milligram three times a day. So what the road trial did tell us very clearly is that it is a safe medication. Yes, some patients can get uh, abnormal blood uh, results like abnormal liver function tests, but generally speaking, it's a very well tolerated uh, drug uh, and some people have been taking it for years. And we also know from other studies run by Santera for frigid cataxia and more recently for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, is that much higher doses have been used in clinical trials. And again, the safety profile has been very good. So I'm not going to go over the fine details, but clearly, when we did the trial, the primary outcome measure was negative, i.e., you know, uh, we did not have a sig significant result. But then when the data was analyzed based on subgroup of patients, there was some evidence pointing towards uh, patients with earlier disease you know, getting a treatment benefit in terms of an improvement in the number of letters that you could read down the vision chart. And there was also a t study published at the same time from the Bologna group from Valeria Carelli and from Piero Barboni, which is a much bigger study. It was a retrospective case series, meaning that they looked at what patients were being treated over a period of 10 years or more. And again, there was a suggestion of benefit for patients 
that were treated early and for a reasonable length of time. <coughs> but what is quite clear is that idebnon is not the magic cure that we all want. It's not going to prevent the second eye from being affected. As I mentioned this morning, in about two-thirds of patients, one eye is affected first, and then three to six months later, the other eye becomes involved. So if you're able to catch someone after the first eye has become affected, and you treat him or her with idebnon, you know, the second eye will still become affected. And certainly, there is absolutely no evidence to provide idebnon to anyone who's an asymptomatic carrier. Uh, if anything, this might disturb uh, the electron flux, and you know, I'm pretty categorical about this. So it was a very long process, because the first time that Santera went to the European Medicines Agency, the uh, application was rejected on the grounds that there was not sufficient evidence, and that the subgroup analysis uh, was open to criticism because of the small number of patients that were involved. And then Santera collected additional data. They went back to the EMA. And in June 2015, more than two years ago now, EMA granted a marketing authorization, but under exceptional circumstances, meaning that for the next five years, the company will need to collect additional data. So we're kind of left in a bit of a limbo at the moment in this country because some European countries, like Germany, for example, have uh, their local uh, national bodies have agreed to pay for the drug and it can be prescribed to patients. In the UK, it's still very much in a state of flux. Uh, in England, you know, we can't prescribe it. It's not yet been uh, approved by anybody. NICE doesn't want anything to do with it. It's probably going to end up with NHS England, which is still uh, pondering on the best way of uh, reviewing the uh, application for Raxo in the, in, as a treatment for patients with labor's optic neuropathy. But what changed this year is that the Scottish Medicines Consortium uh, only recently uh, came up with a decision where the uh, UK Lancet Society had quite a major role to play. Uh, and based on a review of the data and the fact that it's a quite a rare disease and probably only three or four patients get diagnosed every year in Scotland, they decided to give approval to uh, the use of Raxone, but for a very specific group of patients. So these are patients who do not meet the UK criteria uh, for blind registration. So again, a very small patient population because it could very well be that by the time that the diagnosis is made in clinic, the patient has already been registered as being COD sight impaired. And talking to my colleague from Edinburgh, uh, who basically will, sees most of the patients with long uh, Norfolk border, uh, there is still an issue with regards to uh, reimbursement, and it's still not clarified despite the Scottish Medicines Consortium having made an executive decision. So the point is really that even when a drug has been approved by a European organization, in terms of it being implemented locally in a specific country, there's still quite a big road ahead. And this is going to be the same for any future treatment that comes around the corner because all of these treatments come with a pretty hefty price tag and someone has to pay for it. But besides the health economics, I think what is quite clear is that uh, we have to be pretty you know, uh, truthful with our patient as to the potential impact of idebnon for patients uh, with this condition, even if they get treated quite early on. Because only a subgroup of patients will get some benefit. In my experience, the benefit is partial, and clearly there's a much uh, greater incentive to develop better treatments. Having said that, it's good that we have something now that we can potentially provide to our patients uh, in the interim. Something is better than nothing. Because of the controversy regarding adabinone, both locally with my own colleagues and also internationally, uh, the group from Bologna brought a few people together for a workshop in Milan uh, last year in March 2016 to basically review the evidence and to come up with some sensible uh, guidelines about how we should be using adabinone in our clinical practice. The, the main statement is really that Idebnon should be used, but only for patients with disease duration of less than one, in the so-called acute phase of the disease. And the recommended dose is what was used in the road of i.e. 300 milligrams uh, three times a day. There was a bit of discussion about the chronic case, but generally speaking, you know, most people thought that there was no 
convincing evidence to provide idabinone for anyone who's had visual loss for more than one year. And you know, again, this is not based on hardcore evidence, but this is probably based on personal experience and also you know, all the accumulated data so far. And the other big question, because this relates to the length of treatment and also the cost of treatment, is how long someone should be treated with idabinone. And I think here there will be a divergence based on where you are in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in Europe, but the general feeling was that you should treat the patients for up to one year uh, before you give up, right? And this was probably a weakness of the Rodos trial in the sense that the treatment was only for 24 weeks. And potentially, had we treated for longer, you know, we might have seen a much clearer signal between the treated and the untreated groups. Well, what do we do now, right? You know, if I can't prescribe idabinone and it's too expensive for someone to pay for it from their own pocket, at the moment, there is a phase four study which is being sponsored by Santera as part of their requirement by the EMA to collect more data over the next uh, four to five years. And the LEROS study is recruiting patients with disease duration of up to five years. And essentially, you're going to be provided with treatment for up to two years, and uh, this comes free of charge. So we've recruited around 10 patients so far at Moorfields in London, and uh, we probably have about 10 more patients waiting to be assessed for their eligibility criteria. So it is a very difficult area because you know, it's neither here nor there. You know, there is some debate about the true uh, impact of idabinone depending on which group of patients we're, uh, we're dealing with. Um, and you know, um, I suspect over the next 12 to 18 months, there's going to be, there's going to be more discussion about you know, how we fund or whether we fund this treatment you know, uh, to cover England, for example. So having gone through this trauma, right now, you know, there are other, other things uh, that have been tried. So if you read the published literature about three or four years ago, the group of Alfredo Sadin published a small study where patients were treated with EPI743. I think they've accumulated more data so far, but again, you know, we don't have a randomized controlled trial to back up the evidence. And then, as Russell mentioned, the uh, staff of Biotherapeutics have kindly sponsored you know, this meeting today. They also have their own lead compound, which might or might not have a, a, a role to play in the treatment of this condition. Having said that, this goes back to this statement here, which kind of brought together uh, most of the micro experts you know, in, on the international scene, that you know, we are all desperate for treatment. Uh, that's what patients want. That's what we want as clinicians. But in the end, right, if we're going to prove whether a drug is going to work, we need to spend time, and whoever is going to pay for it needs to spend the money to do a proper study with enough patients, with enough power, to be able to come up with a very clear answer, does the drug work or does not work? Otherwise, we're going to end up in the same kind of gray zone where it might work for some patients and might not for others, and there's going to be all, a lot of issues with regards to reimbursement. So, the next topic is really gene therapy. And again, I'm just covering these areas quite broadly. In the panel discussion, there'll be more time to go into the more controversial uh, uh, you know, elements of these uh, therapeutic programs. So why gene therapy? Because there's quite a lot of experience now in the use of these gene therapy vectors in ophthalmology. Because as I mentioned this morning, the advantage that we have as ophthalmologists is we can easily access the eye every day in your average clinic, you know, a lot of patients are having drugs injected directly into the eye, uh, and for a lot of uh, diseases like macular degeneration, for example, diabetes, it's made a huge impact in terms of improving patients' visual prognosis. So with regards to long mutation, if we take all the other complicated factors out, we know, in a very simplistic level, you're having the disease because you're not producing the right level of the protein. So if we're able to replace the level of protein, if we're able to replace the missing defective gene, there's no reason why this should not be effective as a treatment strategy. The difficulty has been that it's been very difficult to design a vector that can penetrate the mitochondria to deliver the gene where it should be going. Uh, and the way that people have gone around this is by using a different technique or allotopic expression, which I won't go into, but based on the data published by the two main groups, the group of José Sayal in Paris and the group of John Guy in Bascom Palmer in Florida, these two groups have basically 
come up with a viral vector. So they basically use a virus to introduce the gene into your cell. And by introducing the gene into your cell, the protein is produced, and then the protein ideally will then prevent your uh, mitochondria from underperforming and will produce enough energy and prevent your retinal ganglion cells from going down the route of cell death. So the vectors have been designed, it's been tested, you know, it's been proven to be safe, at least you know, in uh, mice, rats, and also more recently in uh, primates. And this has led on to the launch of these clinical trials using these gene therapy vectors. And again, the reason why this has been uh, uh, a very exciting period in ophthalmology is because we have this advantage that we can inject things directly into the eye. And even more so, in the context of Leber's optic neuropathy, we don't need to do any invasive surgery to inject the vector. We can just inject it directly because the retinal ganglion cells are just at the top of the retina, if that makes sense. So these were the two trials that were recruiting. Uh, there was one trial called the rescue trial for patients with visual loss of up to six months, and recruitment was closed last month. The other study was a reverse trial, which was for disease duration between six and 12 months. And because it was easier to recruit patients in that group, the study was closed uh, in, I think, in March or April this year. Meaning that you know, by uh, the second half of 2018, the first batch of results should be coming out. But it's not just the, uh, uh, the two genocide trials. There's <coughs> also this chap here, John Guy from Baskin Palmer, who's also running his own gene therapy program funded by the NEI. And again, you know, one expects that more or less you know, the results should be out you know, by the end of 2018. So competition is good you know, because if there are two groups working on the same uh, program, then you know, hopefully either both programs show that it works or both programs show that it does not work. The difficulty would be if one shows a positive result and the other one shows a negative result, but we're not there yet. Uh, and again, I think that we need to be very clear here that all the data so far suggests that this is a safe intervention, but we will only know whether it works when the results get published uh, by the end of next year. And finally, you know, uh, this is something which has become quite topical this year. We had two or three people asking me directly about this uh, in clinic uh, since the start of the year, is whether or not there is any way of preventing the transmission of these uh, labors mutation to their children. Because a lot of the, uh, the classical example would be someone in their 20s presenting. He's a young man. Uh, his sister is around the same age. Obviously, you know, would be at an age where they think about uh, their reproductive options. And uh, this is also an area which is still controversial, and you know, Patrick Chinnery here will know more about the underpinning science than I do. But the reason why this is uh, coming to the fore is because the mitochondrial genome shows very strict maternal inheritance. So we only get our mitochondrial genome from our mothers. And this has led on to the so-called you know, free parent embryo, which is a pretty bad term, but that's what we are left with about how to prevent the transmission of these mitochondrial DNA mutations to the next generation. And this has been a major group and still a major uh, uh, work uh, pipeline up north in Newcastle. And in, 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 the, in a nutshell, it's not complicated the process of what they are trying to do really, right? Because here you have a couple here where the mother carries a pathogenic mutation. You basically do a traditional IVF technique where the egg and the sperm gets fertilized. You remove the uh, pronucleus here, and then you basically use an egg from a healthy woman who does not have it, any pathogenic mutation. You use this as a carrier, and then it goes down the normal roof of uh, embryonic development. But it's quite controversial, you know, as you will know from uh, the media. A lot of people are against it, both from a scientific and from a, you know, uh, I guess, ethical and moral kind of perspective, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but having said that, it's going ahead. You know, people are still working on it. Uh, other people are trying to get additional safety data on the technique. On a practical basis, this has been uh, approved, at least by our uh, parliamentary system here uh, in February 2015. And more recently, the Newcastle uh, Clinic has got a license uh, to move ahead with mitochondrial replacement therapy. So, 
And then I guess the next thing, you know, whether or not we're thinking about you know, uh, a drug, or whether we're talking about gene therapy, you know, I think the clear thing that has become quite obvious is the fact that no single center, no single group can run these uh, trials because getting enough patients in the right group, for example, a disease of less than one year, is pretty challenging. And that's the reason why it's great that as part of this patient uh, meeting today, that we have organizations from France, you know, from Sweden, because this will become increasingly important in terms of these multi-center collaborations. There is also this European Ref Reference Network, which has been launched this year. Uh, Russell Wheeler is heavily involved with this. I am also involved via Moorfields, and so far, it's still an idea which will need to be matured in the years to come. And also, what is probably much more tangible is that in a, in a very short period of time, there's been a number of patient organizations that have been set up formally in a number of European countries, and I do know that there are other um, parts of Europe, like Portugal and like um, uh, Denmark, where they're thinking very heavily about having a dedicated land society. So on that note, all right, I will finish, and I think what we can do is to move on to the questions from the floor addressed to both me and to members of the panel. Right. Um, well, certainly, if you're getting idebnon from Santera, you can be very sure about the, uh, the grade and the quality and the concentration. A lot of patients, especially in North America, would be getting idebnon from uh, various internet sources. And you know, it's difficult to know, you know whether it's actually you know, the, uh, the, the, the right compound, the right concentration. Probably it is. Right, but there's always that element of uncertainty on, 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 you know, with regard to these uh, internet uh, sources of idebnon, and that's pretty much it, really. But having said that, you know, in a lot of these countries, that's the only source of idebnon, and people are taking it. just ask a question about mitochondrial donation. Given that Lavers is not a life-threatening condition, what is the likelihood that a woman would be offered mitochondrial donation to avoid the birth of a child with this condition, especially against the uh, budget cuts in the NHS? Um, so the NHS has found money to do a number of these procedures every year. So there are, I can't remember the precise number, is it 10 a year or 20? 25 a year, I think, right? Um, for, for the next five years? I'm not sure. But I can't remember. Yeah. Anyway, the NHS has found the money to do a limited number. Uh, and, and certainly based on conversations I've had, uh, they're certainly considering uh, women with neighbours' mutations as potential recipients of this treatment. A quick question about gene therapy. Um, if gems are able to prove successful with being able to uh, correct the mutation, you mentioned, Patrick, that, that the theory is that that would then stop the, the ganglion cells from dying. What's your thoughts on how that would affect someone who's in the chronic stage of the condition? At the later stage of the disease, correct? Yeah. Right. So, um, we can't predict on what the results will be, but certainly, you know, if there is evidence that, uh, as I mentioned, there are two trials, right? Uh, one trial is for patients who've had loss of vision for less than six months, and the second trial for patients with visual loss of between six and 12 months, right? The, the best case scenario is that both trials are successful, meaning that if you treat anyone within that one year window, uh, it is beneficial, and obviously if that happens, you know, the next stage will be to do a study on chronic lung or so-called chronic lung. Uh, because there, there is also anecdotal evidence that someone can be two, three, four years, five years down the line and they still get spon spontaneous visual recovery. Um, 
And it's, I, I can't answer this question now. And I think clearly from a kind of, you know, uh, from a commercial perspective, right, you know, if the treatment is found to be effective for the acute group, there will be uh, added incentive to do it for patients who lost vision for more than one year. Um, due to me having my condition, a cousin of mine um, sort of found his early. Um, he started going and somehow was stopped. I'm not sure what treatment he had. Um, just wondering, because I've got other cousins, nephews and nieces, very young, like one-year-old and seven-year-old, what you could recommend to monitor or, you know, keep an eye in case they do get it and then get the earlier treatment like Lydia sort of mentioned was available. i answer part of this. I think it would be useful to have Patrick Chenery's view on this. Uh, with, with regards to uh, how to monitor carriers that have no, not lost any vision, my, my personal viewpoint is, you know, if there's an asymptomatic carrier with no evidence of disease, there's no real point of having any regular follow-ups in an eye clinic because we're still not at the stage where we can predict whether someone is going to lose vision or not, right? It might be different if we're able to pin down the other factors and we could say that your risk is not this nominal 50%, your risk is 90%. But in the context of my own practice, right, I don't routinely review or screen asymptomatic carriers Research is quite different because we do see a lot of families which are involved in research studies, but in terms of the message out there is that there is no need for a regular follow-up for any asymptomatic carrier. But certainly, there is an important you know, point to be made that if you carry the mutation, that you have to be extremely wary about smoking because this has been shown quite convincingly now that smoking is a major risk factor. I'm um, not as strict with regards drinking. I think the occasional drink is fine as long as you don't go on a bend every day, right? Um, there are other risk factors out there that have been put, for example, head trauma, but then what do you tell someone who is, you know, 17, you know, is a keen rugby player, or you can tell him, well, stop playing just because you have a theoretical risk of losing vision. I think it's a very difficult, you know, area. I do tell these potential risk factors, uh, but I'm not one to enforce it, you know, um, rigidly, really. I agree. Um, I mean, in practical terms, all, all you can do is tell the mum of these kids to have uh, heightened vigilance. Uh, and if they're concerned, to take their child to the doctor or to the optician and uh, see if there's any sign of the condition in its early stages. In order to work out who to tell this to, it's useful to engage genetic counselling services, genetics department, who will be able to work out uh, through the family tree, who is and who isn't at risk. Yeah, can I add, actually I was, interestingly, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago speaking to a guy from, well, one of Patrick's colleagues from Munich, and I happen to have a son who's moving to Munich in a couple of weeks' time, and I, so I said, oh, I have a son coming to Munich. And he said to me, oh, well, hopefully I'll see him before too long. And I said, well, no disrespect, but I hope not. And uh, he said, oh, no, no, no. He said, here in Germany, we see non-affected carriers on an annual basis. I said, really? Why is that? And he said, well, because then we can detect any early sign. And I was quite intrigued by this, to be honest. And I thought, is that for his benefit as a researcher, or is it for our benefit as a patient? Because, first of all, there is a cost involved to the system, naturally, but also there's a cost involved, I think, to the patient. And I have to say that, from my perspective, thinking with a patient hat on, the additional stress and anxiety of going for an annual test to see if you're going blind outweighs considerably the possible benefit you might have from, uh, from getting an early indication. People know, you know, it, it's not going to help a great deal at the moment anyway. There is nothing that is going to be an instant cure for this. And I think uh, people need to live their lives and stop 
as far as they can, worrying about what may or may not happen. We, we, you know, we could all get run over by a bus tomorrow, and I think it's terrible that people spend their lives worrying about something that may never happen. Yeah, do you think we're a long way away from a, having a diagnostic tool that could predict when someone, or a carrier, may lose their vision? I mean, I know there, there was a paper a few years ago which sort of seemed to suggest there was a relationship between the amount of M uh, mitochondrial copy in the, in the um, tissue um, and whether that would cause, you know, when you get to a threshold, whether that would cause someone to lose their vision. And it looked as though that might be sort of a promising start of, of getting somewhere near, uh, you know, some sort of tool that could be used in the clinic. But you seem to sort of suggest that that's still some way off. Um, I mean, the work you're describing is still ongoing. Uh, it's part of work that we're doing with colleagues in, in Italy uh, and, and also the, the work that our groups are doing here in Cambridge, uh, as you described in your talk, provides us with hope to be able to identify who is at risk and who isn't. Um, um, I mean, the difficulty with the research is we don't know until we find out how long it's going to take. Uh, it's the unknown territory, but there's certainly effort in that direction. But it does take you back to Russell's point, doesn't it, that even if we could find a genetic test which predicted with absolute certainty that someone was going to lose their vision, uh, it raises all sorts of interesting questions as to whether or not that's information that you would want to know. <clears throat> Can I... Um, this is Chris there. In, in Swedish, we uh, pronounce the abbreviation LHON as live here or now. LHON. Uh, so I'm, I agree with you, Russell, that why should you worry about the future? Um, we, we have to see what we see today. But the question is, what is vision? How do you measure a betterment? So now when we are setting up a register with a role model from Denmark, you know, in Denmark they know the 88 men and the 44 women by name, and there are 60 families. So we put up a register because we hope and believe that there will be a cure in the future. So we can, in the register, for instance, see what mutation gives better or worse vision um, as an end result. But what we are doing now is to try to make a care plan for the eye doctors to tell them what assessments they should do uh, within a visual assessment so we can judge on an international basis what kind of measurements we use. You know, the, the boring measurements of visual acuity. It depends on what acuity chart you, you use. We, we, we think that the OCT and the um, computerized uh, Goldman tests uh, are the ones that we are going to look at into um, during the next three, four months to see if they can complement and tell us if idabenone or other substances work or not. Because then we can see the optic nerve, how many cells there are left or are who are reborn, if you see what I mean. Uh, absolutely, I think you know, essentially you know, this is something that we could spend two days discussing and putting all uh, the experts in the world and would still probably not get a consensus. The main difficulty is essentially, uh, we do have a standardized world measuring vision, which is the ETDRS logmar chart, which is an international standard, which is what the FDA and the EMA will use it's called gold standards. If something improves your vision by 15 letters, for example, it is very likely to seal approval from the regulators. So we do have a standard world well measuring vision. The difficulty with labor's optic neuropathy is the fact that it might be difficult to capture uh, this improvement uh, accurately if someone has very low vision, right? The second thing is obviously something that needs to be done in terms of getting better outcome measures, both in terms of the structure of the optic nerve, and you mentioned here the OCT, which is a fantastic tool. We use it every day in clinic. But the problem with the OCT, at least based on current technology, is once you've lost a certain thickness of the optic nerve, you reach a certain plateau, right? And it does not change very much. And if we take an example of someone with 
long, he loses vision. Uh, the measurement on the OC stays very much the same for 12 months or 18 months, and then his vision improves and the OC measurement stays the same because the technology, the resolution, is not able to detect the change in vision, if you see what I mean, right? So there are other things that people are trying to do. They're trying to look at how quickly the optic nerve transmits information from the eye to the brain, electrophysiology. So this is a certain area which is an area ripe for further research, not just for labor's optic neuropathy, but for the whole area of optic nerve diseases, really, right? But again, this is something which, you know, is not easy to do because you know, it's not something which is very sexy, you see, so it's difficult to get funding for that line of research, unfortunately. Apologies, I wasn't entirely clear about the future of stem cell therapy or treatment. Uh, is, there any, is there any research being considered by the uh, Western world? Oh yes, essentially, you know, I didn't want to be too negative about this. You know, there's a lot of good work being done on stem cells, both in terms of trying to convert, so something which is very topical now is people taking some skin cells, converting them into stem cells, and then using these stem cells to produce these retinal ganglion cells to better understand the disease process. And then hopefully you can use these retinal ganglion cells to screen for potential drugs that might benefit long. Other people are trying to see whether or not they can use these stem cells to protect the optic nerve because they release some good substances, right? I think the point I'm trying to make is the fact that there's been recently a, kind of, you know, a, a major scandal, really, where you know, some stem cell clinic in the US was providing treatment to patients with various forms of blinding diseases. And three patients ended up with very uh, horrific complications because it was, you know, the, God knows what was being injected, really, right? So I think there's a difference between very you know, well thought of research involving so-called stem cells, because this is a pretty broad term, and then some cowboy person opening a clinic and providing with a kind of stem cell injection, that probably is not the real thing really, right? So I think that was my point about being careful uh, of uh, going down the route of unsubstantiated research found on a Google search really. I would add one other point to that. Um, it's easy for me to imagine how you might be able to use stem cells to produce factors, uh, chemicals, which benefit um, ne optic nerve cells that haven't yet died. I can understand how that might be plausible. I think the, the idea that you would be able to replace a dead cell with a new retinal ganglion cell is a very difficult one for me to grasp because it's not just about getting the cell and putting it in the right place but it's somehow got to find its way to rewire the system. Uh, and that rewiring uh, mm -hmm. is essentially trying to copy what happened when the eye was developing and throughout early childhood. And so, you know, although you might be able to put the cell in there, it may not connect the bits uh, that it needs to connect to produce a visual improvement. And in fact, if the optic nerve cells have died or the retinal ganglion cells have died for a long time, then the cells that they need to connect to may also have died as a consequence. So I think it's much, much less likely we'll see stem cells replacing the nerves that have died, um, much more likely that they may help support the existing cells before they die or don't move on or, or die any further. Yeah. I fully agree with you. Just you, the impression we have in Sweden is that if young children affected by LHON get idibinone, they respond much better than people who are older, uh, like 30, 40 years old. Is that uh, just an impression or is that something that you would agree on on a clinical basis? Well, the major problem with this observation is the fact that we do know that children who lose vision, say before the age of 12, to take a cutoff, do much better. They get spontaneous visual recovery. The disease evolves much more slowly. And lung in children is very different from lung in adults. So in your case, unless you do a proper study, you don't really know whether this is just the natural history of 
long in children who do better as opposed to what I might have, be having an effect, right? So I think uh, I, I, I can't commit to an answer to this really. I, I think the other but, thing, Krista, on that is that of course, here in the UK at least, Patrick has been unable to prescribe Edebanone to any of his patients. And so his ability to talk <laughs> about how his patients have responded to Edebanone is really very limited because that's people who have self-administered and found it through other sources. So there's very little control, very little quality in, in any of the outputs that you're going to see. All right, but if, if you lived in a generous country like Sweden, <laughs> yeah. where you can prescribe it, would, would you um, be um, positive to describe it more easily to kids than to 67-year-old men? No, I think really the, the, the question here is not just about you know, who's going to be paying for it. You know, let, if we take, even if we take cost out of it, uh, we need to think about the evidence, really. Right? All the studies done so far have excluded children, right? Uh, and we don't even know whether the disease in children is the same. It could be that in children, there's a whole different set of genetic factors involved, which explains why they get it so early, and which explains why they can do much better than adults. So it's not just a question of giving it because it's free. It's a question of, really, is it effective? Uh, because there's a whole long list of other uh, mitochondrial cocktails that have been given before, coenzyme Q10 and otherwise. So I think we need to be here, we need to put our scientific hat on rather than just giving something for the sake of giving something. Thank you. Mm. Alex. Is there a likelihood of us seeing an FP743 clinical <laughs> trial anytime soon? I don't have an answer to this because you know, there's not been much published since uh, this uh, case series, I think three or four years back. Uh, the company has changed name. It's not called Edison now, it's called BioElectron. It's a very important question. I don't have the answer, to be very honest. Um, but I think it's fair to say that we have been open to work with them to set up such a trial? Oh, absolutely. And, and perhaps I should mention that uh, a word from our sponsors, there is actually a trial ongoing at the moment uh, for Acuvia, the stealth product in the United States. It's a very limited trial. There are no results known, I don't think, are there, Patrick? But there are other things happening. So Epi743, speaking from a position of great ignorance, which is something I do with great regularity, uh, it would appear that if the company themselves had great hopes for it, they'd be doing something about it. We don't see any news. That doesn't mean definitively there isn't a hope for it, but it's certainly not something I'm losing sleep about, wondering what they're doing, to be honest. Their history, I think, for, for most of us for the time being. Is there um, any evidence to show that adebanone could cause the condition to become... Sorry, can you hold the mic closer? Oh, sorry. Any evidence to show that adebanone could cause the condition to become unstable and deteriorate more? Um, certainly the evidence suggests that adebanone does not make, does not have any detrimental effect if provided once someone has started losing vision. Um, so no, I, I personally don't think there is any, any evidence suggesting this. Um, again, speaking from a position of great ignorance, uh, I did actually speak to a chap um, a few years ago who was a professor of pharmacology, so a professor specializing in the chemical actions of drugs. And he went a little further than I think clinicians are able to do in discussing the action of adepinone. And his considered view at the time, and, and I was particularly keen to know whether unaffected people should take <coughs> idebanone to try and stop the, uh, the onset of vision loss. And he was very clear that the pharmacological action of idebanone means that if you don't have vision loss, you absolutely shouldn't take it because it could actually bring on the vision loss. In terms of people who have vision loss, the thinking, 
in that pharmacological world is that any potential damage edebenone could do to somebody is greatly outweighed by the benefit it, it, it produces at another section of the chain. It's very technical. I don't pretend to understand it, but it certainly was enough to make me think, okay, we do not even think about using it as a, what they call a prophylactic, as a way of preventing vision loss. I think for, on that point, everyone agrees that any asymptomatic carrier should not be taking a debit. Yeah, I mean, so I think there's no evidence that it's doing any harm in that situation. Uh, it, it might harm your bank balance if you're paying for it, or the, or the bank balance of the health system, but to, uh, in the pure health sense, I don't think there's any evidence it would do any damage. Hello, I, I just had a, a question about um, triggers, and I appreciate that there is a lot that is unknown about that. Um, but for patients who have sort of gone through the, into the chronic stage and uh, where their vision loss has perhaps plateaued, um, is there you know, any risk to them incurring further deficit to their sight if they drink or if they smoke or if they have head trauma from that point? Certainly, because you know, even... The fact that you've got the initial loss of vision from labors of the neuropathy means that you're already dropping down to a lower level of surviving retinal ganglion cells. Then if you, do, if you have something else on top of that, right, if you're a diabetic and you're, you're treating your diabetes, you know, if you're a chronic smoker, you know, obviously you're putting whatever remains at risk because you might end up losing vision, not from long, but from having a vascular event or from other complications. So, you know, you've already lost a lot from LON, right? So if anything, there's a much bigger incentive to be more aggressive in treating any other potential risk factors for further visual loss. Um, yeah, if no one else has any other further questions, the four of you want to have any closing comments on this as a as an area, final thoughts? Um, I mean, I think uh, it's obviously very frustrating for patients, for families who are affected by this condition that, that we don't have a definitive treatment now. Um, but, uh, you know, when I first went into this field 20 years ago, and, and really even 10 years ago, there was absolutely nothing. And there was actually absolutely no hope of anything. And I think what we've seen, particularly in the last five years, five to eight years, is increasing interest both from researchers and also from companies interested in, de interested in developing new medicines to try and tackle this problem. Uh, and you know, it's frustrating that we don't have a response now, but I think there is optimism because of the effort that's being put in to try and develop new treatments that simply wasn't there a decade ago. Anyone else, Russell, Mark, uh, anything? Uh, really, to just sort of segue into the next section, I would say uh, one of the things that is a constant gripe for me is that it's become quite clear from this discussion and some of the others that there are an awful lot of unanswered questions. The answer to getting those answers to those questions is for us as patients to get more engaged and more involved. There are a lot of things we need to know. It's going to take a lot of resource we're going to need to fundraise and take part in developing this a registry, a natural history of the condition, so that we give the tools to the researchers to be able to build on a stronger foundation. We have to know more about the disease and we have to be a part of the solution. Not, we can't just sit back and wait for it to happen without us. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, guys.
So we're just going to conclude the day with a bit of a, a section talking about the society and where we're at and uh, things looking forward from there. Yeah, so it'll just be one minute and then we'll have a panel up here and we'll discuss not only the society here but from a European perspective as well. Krista, can you join us on the panel? Okay, I'll do that. Yeah. Okay guys, so what we're going to do, just for the last 15 minutes here, we appreciate it's been a long day, we've eaten lots of information, so as I said, just to conclude, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the society here, where we're up to ideas going forward, but also to consider um, partner organisations in France and Sweden and sort of thoughts going forwards. So I'll give you over to Russell just to sort of lead on this. Uh, sorry, we, um, Maurice is here with us as well, but I think for language reasons it's better that she's asked if I'll say a few words on her behalf. Uh, actually, I uh, was very lucky enough to join their annual meeting a few months ago in France, uh, where I had an even greater difficulty in understanding what was going on, quite honestly, because, of course, everything was in French. But uh, Maurice has said that she wants to make clear that they're holding out the hand of friendship to us here in the UK, that we want to co cooperate together and together we can make a stronger force. And, and Krista, I think in a moment, will be adding to that as well. We invited people from other countries as well. It's been quite difficult to get people together, but there are existing LHON organizations in Spain, in Italy, they're, they're organizing one in Germany they're organizing in Portugal they have ambitions and as we build and get a, a, a larger grouping together internationally we can start to achieve a lot more than we can possibly achieve on our own and as I say a lot of that comes down to having numbers of people more members we have about 220 members something like that in the UK we know that there are 1,500, 1,800 people who are likely affected in the UK, another 5,000 family members probably who are unaffected but carriers. We as an organization need to get better at communicating. It's not easy. We don't pretend to have the right answers. We need your help to get involved. And uh, we really invite you to ask us questions in a moment about how you, you know, if you think you want to get involved, ask us how, we'll do our best to answer those. Yeah, I, th I think, we, you know, we've, we've come quite a long way in three years from fairly humble beginnings. And um, as a society, we're sort of, we, we are established now. And I think one example of, um, of what we have managed to achieve was the SMC decision on Idebanone. And, um, that submission that was put through was based on, on your contribution. Um, we sent out a questionnaire and we asked people their views on Idebanone and their views on the condition. 
um, the sort of um, impact it had on their lives and what they wanted to see from the NHS uh, in the way of treatment. Um, so that, that's the sort of thing that, that we are capable of as a society. And we need, to, we need to build on that. We need to grow. We need to improve our networks with other societies. But we can only really do that if we get the support of the members and we get um, more people on board. Uh, you know, you've seen the society at the moment managing is us three. We, we, can't, we can't keep on growing the society if it's just us three doing that. We, we really do need the more help and more input from the members and um, yeah, I, I think we can do a lot, we can make a difference but it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to need more help than we're getting at the moment. Chris, would you like there, to say a couple of things about the Swedish society? The, the Swedish um, association or, or LHONI society, we um, started in March 2012 and uh, 160 persons paid membership, like 10 pounds uh, last year, uh, and we believe that around between 50 and 60 of them are affected. The others are uh, nice family members. Um, and um, we have two goals. One is to support research within um, this huge problem of the small amount of people with LHON, and the other is to support people with LHON and their families. Uh, the second goal means that we meet persons who are newly affected or have had the disease for a long time, and they need someone to speak to. And one of the members, uh, she's a psychotherapist, and she's had the disease for 40 years, and she's been working as a psychotherapist for as long. And she will be a person that we will pay that you can call and talk about your emotional problems. And another issue is um, vision rehabilitation. We are trying to make more eye doctors interested into use of the eye. Uh, there are not very many eye doctors interested in this uh, any longer because there are so many sexy things happening into the eyes that you can inject or take away. You know, you make prophylactic cataract surgery, which is very profitable today. So, but like Susanne trauseter klosinski in Germany, in Tübingen, she is uh, um, making research in training programs for all kinds of eye psychiatric training and so on. And we need more people like that, like in the in the last or in the last generation of eye doctors, we had that cooperation. This is why we could implement vision rehabilitation within the eye clinics, um, uh, which means that the eye doctors can cure everything. Even the, the diseases they cannot cure, they can refer people to vision rehabilitation. So you can use devices and training and support with uh, optical and techniques like or CAM or what have you. So we have the whole thing into the system, which means that the Federation of the Blind that changed names in 1977 to the Federation of the Visually Impaired do not uh, impact or put too much blindness on, on groups who are low vision. So I'm, I'm a bit opposed of people with LHON who call themselves blind if they can see something. Because blindness to me is when you can see nothing. But you do whatever you like. I'm, I'm just saying what, um, what is the um, semantic and, and actual situation in, in our country. You know, readiness for rehabilitation is, is very important. And, and since I'm going to live without a cure of my disease, I think this is important. But I'm very much... Uh, for uh, supporting any kinds of uh, research development within the medical side also. Yeah, well, one of the things I forgot to say as well is that um, some of the things that, we, that you can do can be very small on, on, on your part, but it can be very important to us. I think in the past um, we've put some surveys out to the membership 
you know, we've got a couple of hundred people in the membership and we've had, you know, half a dozen replies. And people have probably looked at it and thought, oh, that's a waste of time. But those sort of things are important. You know, we're asking your opinion. We're trying to, we're trying to get, gauge, um, you know, what you think about things, how you feel about things and, and what's important. And, um, you know, it's a couple of minutes to just fill in a survey, but it's, it's important feedback that we're requesting. Mark mentioned the SMC decision in Scotland, and I think it's worth us just briefly saying that if the Lawn Society hadn't existed when the Scottish Medicines Consortium were considering this earlier this year, almost certainly Raxone would not have been approved in Scotland because it was actually facing rejection. They consulted with patients, we went out to the membership, we actually got a good response, we were able to give um, they themselves described it as a very powerful testimony from patients and they actually decided on the strength of that to give not a blanket approval but an approval uh, for prescribing it in Scotland. Now there are mixed views I think amongst our members and certainly we're aware of that and some people, um, nobody thinks that this is the, the answer to everything but it's a very important step. This is the first treatment for this condition anywhere in the UK. Uh, and there are, the same process is going to be taking place for anything else that comes through. And if anyone thinks it's going to be an easy ride, it's not. In the current environment, with health costs being scrutinized ever more closely, we as a patient group have to be a part of that process. We have to be there to undertake uh, the assessment alongside the authorities and to do that actually we need bodies, we need people who are able to do it. In, in my case because I speak to the companies then I'm no longer regarded as an independent agent. I, I can tell you for sure I would do nothing that was going to impair the health of my family but if you speak to the European Medicines Agency now they consider me tainted because I've been speaking to the companies. We need more people who haven't spoken to the companies to stand up and talk to the agency about the experience of LHON and what's important to the patient community. So we do need a constant flow of people to, to aid that process. I, I agree that this is uh, what we also did in Sweden. We, we, we said to the um, LTV who is deciding on these things that we would like them to have uh, Idebenone as, as an alternative but also to have someone in Sweden who can give advice to doctors prescribing this um, substance. So we are working hard on trying to make Karolinska, you know, where they give the Nobel Prize and so on, as a center of mitochondrial disease and with a branch for LHON because I don't think that every eye doctor uh, or neurologist can, can get into the disease with the same effort as Patrick does. Uh, so we need someone uh, who can answer these questions but we, ne we need no prohibition of b being able to refer uh, to prescribe the, the substance. Yeah. Do I make myself clear? I think so. Are there any questions from anyone here about either ourselves or the French or the Swedish society and where things are and where they can go? Stunned silence. But I do appreciate it's been a, it's been a long day. But, but are, you, are you in England uh, or in Great Britain trying to make um, uh, this city, Cambridge, the centre of LHON in the future? Uh, I don't think we're trying to make but anywhere the, the centre because both the Patrick's are, Patrick Chinnery and Wayu man are working here then obviously in terms of research there'll be a lot going on here but there'll also be other places where research will be taking place from right? Um, so I don't, uh, my opinion is not a... Um, I, I think hopefully it will be a centre because where you, what is the definition of a centre? A centre is somewhere where you get experts gathered together yeah. But at the same time, whilst we want to encourage the, those clusters of expertise to improve the research 
and the understanding of the condition, we want to propagate that to other areas so that that's accessible to everybody. And you know, I mentioned before about the European Reference Network. I think next year, hopefully, we'll be able to give you a much better report on how that is progressing. And when you get that expertise in one center with modern communications technology, we can actually see that expanding quite quickly to much more distant parts of, of Europe. Yeah, yeah, but every country perhaps should have a, a center of excellence and then they sh can cooperate on the European level. Uh, ab absolutely, and, that, and that's what this network is doing. Um, yeah. Sweden, I think, is unfortunately not a member at the moment of this network, but I'm sure there are people there who are looking to join the network from Sweden. Call us. <laughs> um, but yeah, suppose, I was just going to say a second ago, um, the idea now we're with having some food on this evening and people staying around for drinks. If people do have any questions or thoughts, obviously come up and speak to us. And hopefully there's lots of um, topics and um, discussions from today that are quite stimulating that people will be talking about anyway. And then post the event, sometime over the next couple of weeks, we will send out a survey anyway, just on how you found the day and also on the society and ideas and thoughts going forwards, because appreciate that in terms of the volume of, of information today, then all of, you know, everyone's tired at the end of the day and then to say, come on, give us some questions and ideas. It can be easier to just absorb it and in a bit of time, let us know your thoughts and, and where we want to take things. So we will have a, a mechanism for, for gathering people's information post this. We'll probably send a, a, a survey. Yeah, I'll do. I'll, we'll put together a survey monkey and we'll send that out over the next couple of weeks just to have to gather everyone's opinion on, on today and things going forward as well. Mm. What's the, the plan now? Well, we're going to move over to the main building. So, do you want to? Yeah. So, uh, I think we've uh, we sort of finished the, the main session now. So, the plan would be that um, if everybody can start moving over to the main building, that's just just down there. The main entrance to the um, centre is there. There's a um, a desk there where you can check in. It's just like a hotel desk. There'd be a couple of people on reception. So anybody that's staying overnight, you can check your bags in and you can go to your room. I think they did say yesterday that they were going to start serving the evening meal at half seven. But if we think that's a bit too early, we can, all, we can put that back a little bit if people need a little bit longer to get freshened up. But it's going to be a barbecue and a, um, and a buffet out on the terrace. So anybody that can stay... We'll, we'll make it early. We'll yeah. make it at that time because some people... We'll stay for that and then leave, so yeah. let's not make it too late. Yeah, okay, so 